So before we get started, I ask that you join me in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, creator of the universe, we thank you for this day, for we have never seen it before. We pray for your blessing upon this gathering. We are thankful for each and every one here. And we pray that the message that you would have delivered be delivered. That speaker and listener may be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. Jack Handy is a writer for Saturday Night Live. And he wrote... Before you criticize someone, you should walk a mile in their shoes. That way, when you criticize them, you're a mile away and you have their shoes. So what is community of the word? Community of the word is an opportunity for us to wrestle with scripture to excavate and examine the stories in our lives and invite you into those stories to walk a mile with us in our shoes. And so this message today is just an invitation for us to walk together for a mile. A mile in my story and we're gonna, we're gonna take a stop at three different points on this mile. We're gonna stop at each third of this mile. And, and, and I ask you to take this walk with me. Take this walk with me. And if there's something in the story that resonates with you, if there's something in the story that is meaningful to you, if there's something in the story that, that touches you, then we are both blessed today. Is that okay? So can we walk together for a little bit? Would that be all right? All right, thank you. Uh, community of the Word is a really wonderful opportunity for us to, to go deep in this way. And so I just want to thank this community of the Word for, uh, for being there with me uh, in developing this message. And uh, this is as much their sermon as it is mine. So thank you. The topic for today is fresh squeezed gratitude. Fresh squeezed gratitude. And um, why, why did I come upon that particular theme for today? Well, <laughs> this is, what, what is this? Lemon. It's a lemon, it's a lemon. So, so if I squeeze this lemon, what do you think is going to come out of it? Lemon. lemon juice. Let's test it. You were right. Right. And there's seeds too. Uh, what is this? This is an orange. So if I squeeze it, if I apply some pressure, what do you think is going to come out of it? Orange juice. Let, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. <laughs> You're right. You're right. <laughs> what, what have we got here? A grapefruit. If we apply some pressure to this grapefruit, what do you think is going to come out of it? A grapefruit juice, right? Let's see. Let's test it. You were right. You were right. So that citrus e goodness is what comes out when you squeeze it. So, um, so kind of what, what, is, what does that mean? What that means is when you squeeze the lemon, the only thing that can come out is lemon juice because that's what's in the lemon. When you squeeze an orange, the only thing that can come out of it is orange juice because that's what's in the orange. If you squeeze the grapefruit, the only thing that can come out of the grapefruit is grapefruit juice because that's what's in the grapefruit. When you apply pressure to these fruits, the, the juice of that fruit comes out. What comes out of us when we're squeezed? What comes out of us, you and me, when we're squeezed? The only thing that can come out 
is what is inside. The only thing that can come out is what is inside. When pressure is applied, magic does not happen. <laughs> Our best selves don't come out under pressure just because we want it to. It is something that needs to be cultivated along the way so that when pressure is applied, what is good can come out. Does that make sense? Just say yes. <laughs> All right. So, so pressure, pressure is another way of saying anxiety. We all experience anxiety. None of us escape it. We all have anxiety in life. That's what it means to be human, to have anxiety from time to time. Anxiety comes from the word anguish. And I looked up the root of the word anguish. And anguish, the root of the word anguish means to come from a tight place. To come from a tight place, a, a claustrophobic place. So what comes out of us when we're in those tight spaces? When we're in those anxious places, when pressure is applied, as it always is from time to time in our lives? I'd like, on this mile that we walk together, I'd like you to join me on three moments in my faith journey, three moments in my life journey where I was squeezed where some pressure was applied and something had to come out. Something had to come out. And the first one is being squeezed into fear and shame. Being squeezed into fear and shame. The second was being squeezed into faith. Being squeezed into faith. And the last is being squeezed into gratitude. Notice the larger the fruit, the more pressure has to be applied. So is this going to work? And am I, and am I, and am I going to be in the way of it? Yes. Completely in the way of it. So should I move? Okay. All right. Thank you. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I'm going to focus on the hunger part right now. I'm going to focus on the lack right now. I'm not talking about physical hunger because I'm, I have been blessed in my life to never really be physically hungry. I, I've never gone to sleep hungry. I'm, I'm thankful to, to my parents for always making sure that there was food on the table. In fact, I have a love even now for spam. No judgment. <laughs> Because sometimes spam was what was for dinner. My brother, my brother Tony is here, and, 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 and he knows. They, they used to call it, you know, spam gisau. <laughs> spam gisau was on the menu sometimes. I'm talking about a spiritual hunger. I'm talking about an emotional hunger that can sometimes present itself. I want to start by giving you just a very brief background on this scripture and just on the book that it sits in, Philippians. Philippians was written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, Philippians is called the book of joy in the Bible. It's one of the most joyful books, that, it's one of the most joyful letters Paul has ever written because Paul has written some downers. And, and Philippians is full of joy, full of joy. And the reason why, I think, is because Philippians, the church in, 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 in um, thank you, is, is the first church that Paul planted. It's the first church that he, he created. Not created, but planted. And imagine, imagine Doug leaving us for five or six years. No, 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 no. And imagine, imagine... <laughs> This is imagination. 
Imagine him leaving us for five or six years. Imagine the letter he would write to us. Imagine the letter he would write to us. He'd write a letter of love and joy and encouragement, wanting only what's best for us. That's kind of, that's kind of letter this is that Paul wrote. What was interesting about it is that he wrote it from prison. He wrote it from being squeezed. He was, and his, and his companion were flogged. They were beaten unlawfully, and he was in prison, and he was being squeezed when he wrote this letter. The most joyful of his recorded writings comes from a place of being squeezed. My place of being squeezed into fear and shame starts with my original faith community, that of Jehovah's Witnesses. I've talked about this before in this space, but for those of you uh, who may not know, um, I was a Jehovah's Witness from the age of 10 uh, into my early 20s, my, my formative, not my formative years, but my early adolescence, all the way into my young adulthood. Um, if you're not familiar with this, with this faith, it is one that teaches and encourages its members to live in a very closed society. That their way is the only way that all of you in here, unless you became witnesses, are somehow doomed to destruction on the other side of Judgment Day in Armageddon. There's no participation in the world. Don't vote, don't, don't agitate, don't make money, don't worry about it because God's gonna take care of it at Armageddon. That was, that was the tape that was playing for years. No birthdays, we don't celebrate birthdays, no Christmas, no Easter, you don't celebrate any of that because all of that is, uh, is pagan. Uh, don't go to your prom because that's from the devil and uh, you know, don't do any sports, no extracurricular activities, that's part of the world, just preach. Just preach and just, uh, just read the Bible. And be careful, don't go to college. Didn't say that, but it was implied. Be careful with that college thing. Make sure if you're going to college, it's just for that technical skill that's going to support you and help you pay the bills until Judgment Day. Because you might learn something. You might learn something. You might learn that the earth is older than 6,000 years old. You might learn that there weren't dinosaurs in the Garden of Eden. You might learn that you are not supposed to fulfill your God-given purpose. You're supposed to do what needs to be done to get you to the other side of Armageddon. That's the, that's the, uh, the spiritual and religious milieu in which I was raised. And when you buck that system and you don't say sorry, you get disfellowshipped meaning you get excommunicated, which I was. Excommunicated, disfellowshipped, told that because I was just being a, a, a normal young person that I was no longer worthy to continue being in community and being in association with. I was being squeezed. I was being put in a tight place. So much so that even today, I will get shunned at the supermarket line from folks who are still in the community. The Kingdom Hall I used to attend is two blocks up on 199th and Valentine. I still get shunned. It's a reminder of the scarlet D on your chest. I was squeezed. What do you think that, what is that squeeze? What comes out when you're squeezed? What was inside of me? I'll tell you what was inside of me, shame guilt and fear. I was a sinner in the hand of an angry God. What, what's the juice of that? What's the fruit of that? A divided life, a guilty conscience because I'm cut off from the community that I thought I was my, that was my family. I have family. Family's here. My brother and my sister-in-law are here. But I told myself for all these years that I had a different family. And when I didn't go with the program, I was asked to leave. 
squeezed into fear and shame. That was a, that was a long journey. One that's not that far behind me. I'll let you know. However, that's just the first part of the mile. The second part of the mile is about being squeezed into faith because the story doesn't end there. What you have learned and received and heard and seen, practice these things and the peace of God will be with you. The peace of God. The word I want to focus on here in this verse is practice. A practice is important. A practice. I uh, am privileged to, uh, really privileged and, and honored. It's a, it's a gift that, that um, the parents in the room will understand. I am privileged to have uh, two beautiful children, two beautiful boys. And, uh, and I'm thankful that their mom is here today. And, and, and our journey together was not easy and it was rocky and it was difficult for reasons that I expressed in a previous sermon. <laughs> and if you didn't hear it, check the archive. Check the archive, it's in there. It was juicy. <laughs> but, but, the short of it is, is that it was time for us to move on. It was time for us to move on, it was time for us to go our separate ways, and it was time for us to, uh, to no longer cohabitate, to no longer live together. And when you move on, under those circumstances, it's, it's painful. There are stories that you start to tell about whether or not you are a, uh, a failure. And just as importantly, is the financial pressure that comes when one household and one income becomes two households and two incomes. Judy and the boys moved to New Jersey and within a couple of weeks, within a couple of weeks, she was blessed to find a home, a job, and a car. And I'm thankful for that. What I was wrestling with at the time was, how am I going to afford this? Because I want to support my family, I want to support my children, but I also have to pay my own bills. And the story, the tape that gets played is, you're a father. This is what you're supposed to do. You're a man. This is what you're supposed to do. The manhood tape starts running and all the expectations that come around that. And I was far, far from being married to my wife. Far <laughs> from being married to Noni at that point. So I didn't have the shelter of a two income household to run into yet. We're a long way from that point. In fact, what she often says to keep me humble, to keep my big head from getting any bigger, is it's a good thing you're cute because this thing was not <laughs> destined to work out. It was not, it's, there was no guarantees. <laughs> so when I'm being squeezed with the economics of how am I going to support my children? What do you do when you're squeezed economically? What are, the, what, are the, what are the first feelings that come up when you're squeezed economically and you don't think you can make ends meet? Fear, panic, anxiety. So I did what any salsa instructor would do. I said, I'm going to teach more Susie Q's. I'm going to teach more cross-body leads. I'm going to hustle. And I'm gonna teach as many private lessons and dance classes as I can. But that wasn't enough. That wasn't enough. The next thing I had to do is I had to look at what can go. What can go? Where can I make some cuts? And you know where the first cut is? New day. So you know what? Maybe I can cut the tithe. Maybe I can cut the giving. They'll understand. Pastor Doug will understand. I'm going through it right now. Let me cut it. I'll get back to it later. Look, I, um, 
I would love to say that it was a prayer practice. I would love to say that it was a meditation practice. I would love to say that it was because I was steeped in scripture that I was able to get through this. But it, 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 those weren't my practices. The only practice I had was giving. Was giving faithfully, was giving consistently. God didn't show up in a dream. God didn't show up in a scripture. God didn't show up, and God just said, keep giving. Trust, give. And I had to get squeezed into some faith in that moment. Because it's not faith if it doesn't get tested. If it's not tested, it's knowledge. You know it. But if you don't know, that's when it's faith. And so I sat down with the books. I sat down with the calculator. I said, man, all right. I'll keep giving. I'll keep giving. It was my practice. And it was all I could hold on to in that moment. But guess what? You mentioned action. I had to take some action with that too. So I went into the office and spoke to my boss. And I said, it's time for a raise. And I was loath to do that. And it was a fight. But it was granted. And it was just enough. It's just enough to cover the gap. It wasn't manna from heaven. It wasn't, it was the right time. It was taking action after standing in a faith commitment. And God delivered me through that. Squeezing into faith means sometimes trusting in your practice. Seeing it through, even when you don't see the results. Now, if this, if this topic bothers you, if it, if, it, if, it, if it wrestles with you, because I know, I know what you're thinking. Some of you are saying, I, that's good for you, but I'm trying to rub two nickels together. I'm trying to pay, I'm trying to, I'm trying to work three jobs just so I can pay my rent. I, I did some work two months ago that I still haven't gotten paid for. I know what that means. I know what you're going through. I get it. I get it. If this bothers you, if this, if this, if this sort of confronts you in some way, I invite you, join us. Join us in our faith and finances growth group. We'll tackle it together. We'll, 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 we'll wrestle with it. We'll test it. See if it works. But the journey doesn't end there. What about gratitude? What does it mean to have gratitude? Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about these things. What are we thinking about every day? What are we thinking about? You know, gratitude is, as I was preparing this, I was thinking about gratitude. Gratitude is a word that can be overused. It's a word that can become vacuous because it's so overused and we don't, we don't, we don't apply it anymore. It's like a word we put on a grant application, like transformation, social justice, and success. These words don't mean anything after a while because we use them over and over again. What is gratitude? What does it mean to have gratitude? Um, there's a, uh, a, a Benedictine monk that I heard on a podcast recently. His name is David Steindl Rast, and he gave a really practical definition of what gratitude is. Gratitude is not just this thing that sits in the air that you hope falls on you one day. It's two actions. It's thanksgiving and gratefulness. Thanksgiving and gratefulness practiced at any moment, at any moment. You have access to it. Doesn't mean that we are grateful for everything. It means that we can be grateful in any moment. How do we do that? He gives us three simple steps. Stop, look, and go. Stop, look, and go. Stop right there in a second. In a second, stop and notice what's happening in that moment. Look, 
Look for the opportunity to give thanks and go, go in the direction of that thanksgiving. Go in the direction of it. Stop, look, and go. Over the last few years, my home life has been, has been great. I am, uh, I am thankful to uh, be married to an amazing woman. I am thankful to have an incredible family and have incredible children. Things are not perfect, but I'm grateful. So what happens when that boat gets rocked? What happens when something squeezes you? What happens when you get squeezed? Um, in October, I got a call at my office. I got a call and it said, uh, is this Mr. Lopez? I said, yeah. He said, your son um, has had a seizure. Your son has had a seizure and we need your permission to take him to an emergency room. When you get a call about one of your kids, everything else stops. Everything stops. All the stuff on your calendar, all those things you think you have to get to, falls off your calendar. It's not important anymore. It just drops. So your son has had a seizure. We need to take him to the hospital. Can we take him? Absolutely. Go ahead. And I had to leave. I was shaking. I was in my office, which is on 31st Street, and I, f I had to figure out how to get to Teaneck, New Jersey. And so, you know, I went to the Port Authority. The Port Authority's got a hundred million buses going out of it. Had to figure out which one it was. Um, I got on the bus and I made it out there. And Judy was on her way from work. Um, we got to the hospital and you know, he, my son was fine, but there's something about seeing uh, your son in a hospital bed. It's just, it's disconcerting. It's dis, it just doesn't, you don't feel well. And uh, he was in, you know, he was in great spirits. He said that, um, you know, he got to ride in an ambulance and he could check that off of his bucket list. <laughs> 12-year-old has a bucket list is probably a fault of my parenting. <laughs> now, there is a lot, there's a lot that can go wrong in a situation like that. There's a lot you could focus on that takes you into a dark place. But I am thankful that together we practiced gratitude, thanksgiving, and gratefulness. There was so much to be thankful for in that moment. My son seized in gym class. If you're gonna seize anywhere, that's the best place to do it, where there's trained PE teachers who know how to handle that kind of thing, not on, a, not on the stairs, not crossing the street, that there's a hospital 10 minutes away and that the ambulance came like that. That when he got there, the pediatric neurologist who's normally in the hospital once a week was there that afternoon and was able to see him right away. That when we spoke to the pediatric neurologist, he says, listen, we see these things from time to time. Is there anything you could tell? We said, listen, he has, you know, we, we were able to die. We were able to say, well, these are the symptoms that we noticed. We didn't know there were symptoms in the past. We were able to speak those symptoms out. And he says, oh, then I know what that is. I know exactly what that is. We see that all the time. A diagnosis. The same day. Didn't have to wait for months of tests to figure out what this was. We got a diagnosis the same day. There was so much to be thankful for. There's so much to be grateful for in that moment. And then, last but not least, certainly not least, is the sight of Noni and Pastor Doug walking through the hospital door. Immediately, community and family showing up to support, to hug, 